Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing today? Oh, we could do better than that. How are you doing today? Awesome. It is so awesome to see all of your beautiful and bright faces on this very rainy day. So thank you so much for being here. My name is Ayin, and I will be your MC today. It's actually kind of crazy because I grew up under Kayleigh's care, and I've also worked alongside her for many years, and so I am back again. <laughs> so thank you, Kayleigh, for having me. <laughs> yes, greetings and welcome to all of you to the Her Story Awards program hosted by the DC, Maryland, and Virginia chapters of Women's Federation for World Peace. Today's program is hosted in honor of Women's History Month and International Day of Women. Let's offer a round of applause for all those who have gathered here today. We believe in the importance of celebrating women. While we may not seek out opportunities for recognition, we've made our we've made it our mission to acknowledge the impact of women, that the impact women are making in our communities. Our world needs women's touch and peace, peace building today, and these are women providing just that and so much more. By uplifting and honoring the work of our fellow women peacemakers, we know that we can shine a brighter light in our world that desperately needs so. These awards are our way of saying thank you and welcome to the Global Women's Peace Network, where you are connected with hundreds of like-minded women across the country and the world. WFWP USA celebrates extraordinary women through the Her Story Award. We, not, we honor not only their achievements, but the remarkable journeys behind them, showcasing courage, compassion, and resilience through all their challenges. As each recipient shares their lessons gleaned from their story, they inspire and mentor others to do the same. This award emphasizes that every woman holds the power to lead and affect change for the greater good. This award is a tribute to all women as peace leaders living by the logic of love. We thank you for your support today in this program and this historic and transformative experience. And we invite you to consider yourself an active contributor to today's experience as well. So, to begin our program today, we will start with the interfaith water ceremony. And for those who are not familiar with that, it is um, a tradition as an organization for us to honor the many ways in which people honor, our, honor and relate to our creator through different religious practices. So we would like to welcome to the stage representatives from three different religions to participate in the interfaith water ceremony, which symbolizes the wisdom of all religions coming together to create a more peaceful world which honors our creator. At this time, we would like to welcome to the stage representative from Islam, Imani Abdullah, communicator director from the nation's masjid. We would like to also invite the representative from Christianity, Reverend Reginald Hart Sr. and wife, Ms. Vanessa Machado. And lastly, we would like to invite representative from Hinduism, Mrs. Indira Kumar, president of the Global Economic Foundation. And as our representatives stand before us today, we would like each of them to offer a small prayer in their own religious practice as well. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And assalamu alaikum. Ramadan Mubarak. Ramadan Mubarak is the greetings that we give to acknowledge the month of Ramadan. So we are in the month of Ramadan. I am going to be doing prayer in English and Arabic. And then my sister Atari will talk about peace. Bismillahi Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Arrahman Nirahim. Maliki Yomidin. Iyakina Budua. Iyakina Stain. 
It's Dina Sirotol Mustakim. Sirotol Ladina and Anta Alehim. Gairil Makdubi Alehim Waladolim Amin. In English, with the name of God, the most merciful, the most beneficial. Praise be to God, the Lord of all the worlds, the master of the day of judgment. You do we worship, and your aid do we seek. Guide us on the straight way, the way of those who incur your peace and not your wrath. Um, amen. Good morning, everyone. Peace and blessings to you all. And it's just such an honor, such a delight to be invited and to be here today with everyone and with it being Women's History Month. So again, this is timely and it's, it's needed. I just wanted to share a brief um, sentiment about what peace means to me. Um, standing here right now with all these wonderful individuals, representations of how we all express our worship of the creator of the universe. I mean, you cannot think, you know, I mean, one always wonders, like, you know, if there's, you know, a flower blooming or, you know, just the rain that we're having today. And just to, to think about that, meditate on it, and we all have these different representations of how we worship our creator. So it's all very nice. And that's what peace means to me, just coming together. Everyone here today that took time out of their schedules, this is a great representation of peace. And the um, faith of al-Islam with us being in the holy month of Ramadan, it's just a time of year to reflect, to really try to hold your own personal peace and reflect on that be of service to others. So thank you, that's what peace means to me and to the community. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's such a pleasure to be able to be amongst people of various faiths, mm -hmm. because that was the original intent. Uh, I'm Rev Reginald Hart, senior, uh, representing the Christian uh, community. And one of the uh, things uh, that uh, is so important at, to understand that if you have really given your life to our Creator, who in the Christian community we refer to as God, uh, there are many names for God. All of them are correct. Yes. And once you have sincerely given yourself to him and his work and being dedicated to building his kingdom in the earth realm. And there's a difference between the world and the earth, by the way. Okay, the world is where all our problems are. The earth is where God's kingdom is. And one of the other things that I have been able to understand is that now that I have done that, that I have given myself completely to the work of our creator, then I have the authority to pass on blessings to anyone that I'm instructed or I feel by the guidance of the Holy Spirit to actually uh, bless in the name of our Creator. So, in the name of God our Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Father, Father God, I come to you in the name of your blessed Redeemer, Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And I do pronounce blessings upon this event today and pronounce your blessings upon each and every person and their families. 
we are so grateful and thankful that you have placed this place of worship where you designated and ordained Father Moon and Mother Moon to be the leaders of. We thank you for all of the other worships, places of worship and organizations of worship that all understand the importance of humanity, that the most precious thing that you have made, which you have made everything in this, that's in this earth, the most precious to you is your human being, man, woman, and children, male and female children. So Father, with the authority that you have bestowed upon me, I do pronounce blessings upon everyone here. And I pronounce your blessings and ask for your work within all of the evil and all of the unpeaceful situations that's in this earth realm at this given time, here in the United States of America and in all other countries where you have those that are warring against each other. And I ask your blessings upon even households, families, where the members of those families are warring against each other. So Father God, I lift all of this up to you in the precious and matchless name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Good morning and namaste. Namaste means the divine in me bows and respects the divine in each of you. And on behalf of the Hindu community, I would like to um, say a few words. Again, Hinduism is a very ancient philosophy that existed thousands of years. And in India, many, some of you may know it, some of you may not. It's a new terminology, but it's, we believe in the Vedas, which was words passed on through the rishis over centuries and thousands of years. We believe in nature. We believe that we are all part of nature. Einstein says, says E equals MC square. What does that mean? It means that that energy that pervades the entire cosmos is all the same. If we break it down to the subparticles, we're all made up of the same chemical compositions. So whether be it you, me, it, his, the trees, the animals, we're all part of that consciousness. So that's why Hinduism believe and, and is misinterpreted that we have thousands of gods. It's because everything could be part of that energy. So therefore, if we live in the mountain areas, we worship the mountain, or we live near the river, the river becomes our force of, source of focus, or, you know, and it goes on and on. So um, it's not that we believe in millions of gods. We believe in that ultimate energy that pervades the entire universe of which we are part of. And um, so with that, I will also um, say a few things, uh, a short prayer. And then at the end, I would like to have you engage in a, in a peace mantra. A mantra is a Sanskrit verse that I will recite in, mantra, in, in Sanskrit, and then I will explain in English. And um, before I start, uh, and then I'd like all of you to participate, and unlike our colleagues here have said, that we're not different. We're all part of that same cosmic dance. If you look at the CERN Institute, you know, they've got the, the Shiva, which is the energy, the energy that pervades. And if we realize that, there'll be no conflict. It's, it's not that you're better and I'm better and my philosophy is better and his is not good. We are all the same. India has been a, a force that has recognized, it has accepted the Jews when they were persecuted, the Zoroastrians when they were persecuted, they all found the home 
Even the Muslims, they found the place in India because India believes that there's no difference. You are just praying in a certain manner and I'm praying in a certain, but we're all focusing on that same supreme being. And the supreme being in my understanding is not above, it's within. We all have to reflect within. Christ says, be still and know that I'm there. What did he mean? Start focusing on thyself, you know, meditate, calming the mind. The mind is so agile. It goes in 10 different, 10,000 thoughts every second, split seconds. Bring back to that where, where I am, who I am. So God is within. It's, we are all searching that he's somewhere up above or wherever. In my view, he is here. So somebody said about service to God. That is the ultimate. We all have to, you know, as we, we develop our families and our family values, we get educated. But the end of the day is that we have to be of service to others. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about our society, our country, and the world. And if we realize that, we will keep giving. And the Lord gives us that energy to give. I feel I'm an instrument, and as long as I can, I'll be doing. And I believe that I will reach my God realization in the form of sewa. Sewa means service to all. And that is, according to Hinduism, it says that service has to be unconditional. I cannot say I'm serving and I'm expecting something. That defeats the whole purpose of my giving. So it has to be an unconditional giving with no expectation of a reward. So if you're a doctor, do thy duty as a doctor. If you're a teacher, teach. Do not expect the money that I want to be um, you know, a rich doctor. The rewards will come, and that, record, and that rec reward may not come as a monetarily gain to you, but the inner satisfaction that one gets by giving. I, I don't think money can ever compensate us for that. And I'm, a, and I'm a firm believer of that. So let's all bow our heads. I'll say a few prayers and just meditate upon who we are and who we are in this big universe. The MZ square, we, each particle of the matter has so much energy. The C, equal, the, the C that is in the formula is the, um, the speed of light multiplied to the square, 200,000 miles per second times the square root of that. Look at the energy that each one of us and each particle within us. So if we use that energy to its full potential, you can imagine the cumulative energy that we can contribute to the world. So with that, I will just ask you to just bow your head, close your eyes for a minute, focus on your breath, because your breath is a given. And um, you know whatever you believe in, focus on that. I will focus on my, my forehead. The, the, the Indians believe that the forehead, there's a gland that's very important and goes to the brain. So I will say, Om, 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 Tam Soma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya O Lord, lead us from unreal to real, from darkness of ignorance to light of wisdom, from death and misery to immortality. I will also like to say, Om Dyao Shanti Antariksha Gwang Shanti, Prithavi Shanti, Rapa Shanti, Rashadhaya Shanti, Vanaspatya Shanti, 
विश्व देवा शांति ब्रह्मा शांति शांति रेवा शांति श्यामा शांति रे दी शांति मीन्स पीस सो आई विल रीड दैट मे देर बी पीस इन दैवनली रीजन मे देर बी पीस इन द एटमोसफेयर मे पीस रेन एंड अर्थ मे द वॉटर्स बी सूदिंग एंड मे द मेडिसिनल हर्ब्स बी हीलिंग मे द प्लान्स बी द सोर्स ऑफ पीस टू ऑल मे द एनलाइटन पर्सनस ब्रिंग पीस टू अस मे द वेदा स्प्रेड पीस थ्रू आउट एंड मे अदर ऑब्जेक्ट्स गिव अस पीस मे दैट पीस ब्रिंग पीस to us and may that peace pervades the entire universe om shanti 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 thank you thank you so much everyone i would like to now each ask each person to please take a glass of water from the table in front of you representing the wisdom of your faith and please slowly lift the glass in the center to honor our creator and pour the glass into the bowl representing the unity of our spiritual traditions let's give them a round of applause as we honor the divine wisdom of our creator thank you very much you may be seated Next to introduce the Her Story Awards, I would like to invite the very own Miss Kayle Moffett, President of the Women's Peace Web Federation for World Peace USA. Thank you Ayeen and thank you so much for joining us today. We had a happy problem where we had to add an extra table and extra chairs and that's something to be celebrated. So, big round of applause for everybody for joining us this morning. I also really want to thank all of those who were able to contribute the interfaith prayer, those who came and set up. My mom and I made this beautiful balloon arch today. Every oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> so it's always my great pleasure to host these Her Story Awards. I've done many of them in the last year, and no matter how many I do, I'm continually moved by the stories of women leaders. the challenges they've overcome the lessons that they've learned and i find that i always glean something new that can be applied in my own life the women that we're honoring today are the women who do this work because of who they are they don't do it for the accolades and oftentimes they may shy away from being appreciated and being uplifted but today is about making a stand and appreciating the women leaders who are transforming our communities As Ayeen mentioned, this month is Women's History Month. It's also International Day of Women earlier this month. So it's the perfect time to celebrate women. The United Nations also just finished hosting its 68th Commission on the Status of Women, where women leaders from all over the world come together in New York City headquarters to discuss the unique issues and challenges of women. Our way of uplifting women is by honoring them today. You may have noticed the unique title of this this uh, award, the Her Story Award. We're very grateful for the many men who have contributed to a better world and a more peaceful society who have shaped history. But yes, let's give thank you. Sue led that one. Thank you. And we there have been many of them and many of their stories have been told and so we're grateful for them. But today is really about of up uplifting the stories of women leaders who are making a difference who don't always get a chance to be recognized. And so I want to ask everybody to turn to a woman in this room and look at them and say you are doing a great job. Thank you.
<laughs> and now I see it going all around the table. Fantastic. Because while we are awarding just a handful of women today, every woman in this room deserves an award. And we're so grateful for who you are and the difference that you make. I think we would all agree that our world is going through a lot right now and is in desperate need of peace. And there have been many great efforts to work towards peace building internationally and nationally. But from my vantage point, it feels that something has been missing in this approach. Somehow peace has not become long lasting and war and conflict continues to pervade the world. It's my belief that I really feel the woman's touch in peace building could be that missing piece in peace building. And that's why it's so important to uplift that voice. It may not always be as strong, it may not insert itself as much, but that voice could truly be the healing touch that's missing in our society today. Our organization, Women's Federation for World Peace, was founded in 1992 by Dr. Hak Jahan Moon and her late husband, Reverend Dr. Sun Myung Moon. Now, Mother Moon is one of the most well-renowned world peacemakers today. And while her accolades are long, for me, I find her to be a personal example of women's leadership. And her model of leadership as a woman is something that I've really grown to respect and try to practice in my own life. She was born in 1943 in what is now North Korea. And at just six years old, she, her mother, and her grandmother had to escape to the south as war was coming for the Korean Peninsula. So she knows the suffering of her people, of poverty, of war. And it's this experience at such a formative age that formed her calling to build a more peaceful world. And she and her husband have dedicated their lives very sacrificially to starting hundreds of organizations that work towards peace. Their amazing accomplishments include meeting unprecedented meetings with Kim Il-sung from North Korea, Mikhail Gorbachev, interreligious work all around the world. And now she has formed a network of hundreds of thousands of leaders from every, every area today. More than that, it is her particular take on women's touch and women's leadership that I think is so necessary today. I want to read a quote from her memoir where she talks about the power of women. She says, women have the magical power to create harmony and to soften hearts. Brides build bridges. The world of the future can be a world of reconciliation and peace, but only if it is based on the maternal love and affection of women. This is the true power of womanhood. The time has come for the power of true womanhood to save the world. Let's give that a round of applause. So this vision for the work of women is what encompasses the work of Women's Federation for World Peace, and it's our guiding compass in all that we do. And we want to partner with our counterparts, the men that are already doing great work, and be able to bring together both the masculine and feminine voices and peace building. So I want to thank everybody sincerely from the bottom of my heart. We've been looking forward to this program for weeks, slightly stressed out also but grateful that we're here and all your beautiful faces are beaming today. And I'm truly looking forward to all of our awardees today who will share their stories with us. Thank you very much. Kayla, you're doing a great job too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mrs. Moffitt. Unfortunately, uh, Ms. Regina Jefferson could not make it today, but on behalf of her, I would like to congratulate all of our recipients, and also thank you, everyone, for joining us in celebrating these women today. Next, we have our celebratory performance. This is a very exciting part, um, given by the Youth and Students for Peace dance team. Let's please welcome them up.
That was awesome. Did that not give you so much joy? <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much, Youth and Students for Peace dance team. Now, for the main event for today, I would like to begin introducing our awardees for today. First, I would like to introduce Ms. Sonia Reyes, the founder of the Family Life Consulting Services, LLC. Yes. <laughs> Sonia Reyes is a master coach, a public notary, a life, health, relationships, marriage, finance, and entrepreneurship coach for the Li Family Life Consulting Service. After leaving El Salvador, she came to the United States, States at the age of 17 in pursuit of the passion for humanitarian services. She focused on empowering couples and parents with health, life, spiritual coaching and financial strategies to reach their full potential in all aspects of their lives after experiencing an eye-opening crisis within her own family. Sonia offered a message of empowerment of women and men, urging them to awaken a belief system that cultivates ethics and values within themselves to empower families to live for the sake of others for a greater purpose. Before we bring up Ms. Reyes, I would first like to invite the person who nominated her for this award, Ms. Concha Marcatelli, to share a few minutes about why she nominated her. Thank you. All right. So my name is Concha Marcatelli, and um, I met Sonia in a bus on our way to New York for a spiritual revival. I sensed a beautiful spirit in her, but did not have any more contact. Remember that? <laughs> so fast forward three years, and we were in the same place at the same time once more and reconnected. In this occasion, I intentionally took the time to learn more about her. And since then, we worked in some projects together. What I discovered is that as a bee transformed pollen into honey, she transformed tragedy into victory. And that really touched me as I got to know her more. So I nominated Sonia because she was able to turn a family tragedy into an opportunity to grow and serve her community. Her husband was shot by a group of young people, and rather than holding on to resentment, which is the cancer of the world, she created programs to help travel youth and to strengthen families. Since then, she has dedicated her life to make this a better world, one person and one family at the time. So when I met her the second time, I said, oh, this is a message from God. I'm not letting her go. <laughs> so I intentionally made an effort to create and develop more of this relationship. So it's my honor today to invite here Sonia Reyes for her story award. Please welcome her. so beautiful. Thank you very much for being here. It is a blessing. Thank you, Eva. I am not a speaker. <laughs> I'm just a lady, a mom, a daughter, and a grandmother that is here to tell you that everything is possible if you don't act upon the emotional. Behind the emotional, there's the message. There's the strength, and that is the God within you. 
and within me. So that's the one I use during all of these situations that I experience in life. So thank you very much. Thank you, Concha. Thank you, uh, the Women um, Federation. Thank you, Global Peace Federation, and all the organizations that are uh, united and in unity to have this event together. And we do this for the whole world, not just for one community. So to tell you about my story, which has a lot of characters all over the places, We'll need at least a week to be here. <laughs> but I'm going to try to do as simple as possible. My grandparent has two daughters who got married with two brothers from another mother, OK? <laughs> My other grandmother. So two daughters with two brothers. I am the fruit of the youngest couple, the younger couple. At that time, my grandmothers uh, played a very role, um, a very important role, because they took care of me. So that's why, as a grandmother, all the mothers and grandmothers in here, you are needed in the world. So I collected everything I could with uh, my, my grandmothers. Even though my grandfather was there, too, who was a poet, I learned a lot from him. But my grandmothers, they were midwife. So they helped me how to give life. My grandmother assisted my mother so I can born, so I can be here. So um, this young couple left the child under the care of the grandmothers, and they left to work. Every time they come, they come with another brother or with another sister. <laughs> So I was never the only one. So until they have five. So I'm the first one of six. Have uh, two brothers and three sisters. Um, during that time, I thought I was going to go with my parent. But uh, the time they took me, it was to do babysitter for my, grand my, my brothers and sisters, which was very common at that time in my country, El Salvador. I am coming from a very um, united family, humble, but love family. They, there's no much drama, no nothing. You work for the solution. You do something about it, something that will give you a solution, construction, constructive. That, that was the type of family I had, <laughs> even though we were humble. And uh, when I came to this country, it was, I came because I really wanted to help families not having the same situation I had with, with my family. It is not easy to live with your grandparent, even though they had a lot, of, I had an extra dosage of love for everybody. But uh, the love of parents is, very, is needed. So I miss that a lot. And uh, I created a lot of insecurities. But I felt so lonely. But at that time, guess what I did? I used that time in me. And guess who I discovered there? The universe. I discovered God. I discovered all the potential. I discovered all the solution. All the job that we need to do now in the society, I found it in me. So now I understand that when the Bible says the beginning and the end, the, the alpha and the omega, a lot of people want to understand that. But now I do. So I appreciate, I will never change those moments of loneliness because I transform that. So I found the, all the solution, the love, the job, the, the uh, forgiveness, the values, the principles I needed. I had it in me. So I worked. When I came to this country, I said, I, I, I have to find a way to work with people to let them know that the solutions are in us. If we see something wrong in the uh, society, 
is not out there. <laughs> That's only the omega. The alpha is in you. So if you see something wrong out there or in somebody else's, it's not that person, it's you. So go back to the fountain. Go back to the, to the um, alpha. Go back to the beginning, which is inside of you. This, the uh, society is made out of uh, uh, systems. And if you stop and think, all of these systems are made from uh, the university. Doctors need to study 8, 12 years, 16 years, and so on and on. Um, accountant to manage the financial, political, um, education system. You need to have a, a profession before you perform in a system. The family is a society system too. What is our university? What is the marriage university? No. So we go to school to prepare for one thing, for one special thing to do a job. But to do everything, it's inside of you. And if we, don't, if we can't find it, we, can, we get too busy, we don't have time along with us, along with that God inside of us. It's going to be a mess, and that's what is going on in the society now. So the family system needs to go back home. The architect made houses, beautiful houses, with different spaces, and every space has a, a purpose. Our body is made out of systems, too. If we don't know our 12 systems, their function, and how they can work in my benefit for a greater purpose, mm, we need to work more. And that was me. So I needed to work more on me. So I found another situation. 21 years ago, my, my husband was uh, shot, was robbed, shot by two African-American boys, young boys. And while he was uh, bringing the tools to the uh, place where they were working, um, these two persons came and asked for money. He got surprised, and they shot him. So he doesn't know, my handsome husband there, <laughs> he doesn't know if, if because they got scared, or, but they ran away after they did that. So he had 14 surgeries. Um, a year and a half in rehab in Baltimore while I was working in the medical field, which I did for 27 years. Um, I was the coordinator of different clinics, and I um, make arrangements to handle all of these situations. So while the doctor was performing the surgeries, made a mistake, clamped the artery for too long, and he became paralyzed. So. When you see him stand, he's gonna do it with crutches. Don't be surprised. <laughs> so he's, he uses crutches. He's, he has partial paraplegia. So that situation taught me a lot of things too. Those two boys became from a family with parents who got too busy and there was a deficit there in parenting. The doctor got too busy because he needed to see other patients. There was a deficit, too, there. And not in the profession, more than the profession as a, as a human being. If we get too busy in the, in the world, we tend to forget. We tend to disconnect with who we are. So if we know our systems in our body, we will be in harmony. So everything we do, we're going to be more conscious about it. So. The, the two boys, I, I learned how to forgive. The doctors, I learned how to forgive. And during this uh, situation that I passed with, with this 21 years now, uh, also I learned to forgive because resentment, it only destroys your soul. And that's not what I'm here for. 
I'm here for the opposite. So if you don't know your purpose, here, I'm not talking about here, but outside in the community, if individuals, if families don't know, if parents, if marriages don't know their purpose, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss the, 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 uh, the greatest richness that is in that, in that union. So in marriages, it's not just the physical intimacy, sexual action. That is like this. Everything else has to prepare you to have a beautiful encounter, a beautiful intimate encounter. So as I told you, my story, it's, it's very long and it has multiple characters. I will need a week to, to tell you everything. But at least what I want to, to, to focus on is that the, um, the consciousness needs to be awake. We need to be more useful. We need to use it. We need to be more present. Mindfulness of who really we are. What's our purpose in here? If we see something wrong in somebody else, it's not that person, it's in, in us. It's let's, let's see how I can work together. And I think that's, that's the calling today. Because like the tree has root, trunk, branches, and fruit, if we uh, want something better than what we're seeing now, let's work on a healthier root so we can have happier fruit. And that's the calling today, because I really want to leave this world better than I found it. And together we can do it. We have different tools. So in family life, that's what I developed from this program, that's from this incident, I call it crisis, from this crisis, I convert it, I transform it into um, Christica, like Christ. I, I transform it into Christ. Um, it's 30, 37 years now that we empower marriages in different churches, different communities, different beliefs, because marriage doesn't have a, a religion. Marriage is love, and love is not hided like the light is not to be to keep it hided it's to bring it out it's to bring it out so i think that's what i'm gonna leave you today with this message that the the uh the society is sustained by the family the family is sustained by the marriage marriage is sustained by parents by families and if we see something wrong in the families, we need to go to the beginning, which is to the fountain, to the alpha. You know, we know the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. The beginning is in us. So we have uh, to find ways to enrich us, to empower us, like I did in this program. Um, I didn't even want to do like um, promote myself or to do like social media or videos. A lot of people has asked me, do TikTok, do this, do that. And I say, no, uh, not yet, not yet. A, a message that I got from God, it was not just to be like that. It's one person, one parent, one family, one marriage at a time. So once we have which I have in different cultures, thousands, in 37 years, this is the time. This is the time now that we need to come out. So everything has a reason. There's a reason why I'm here today. There's a reason why Concha, Miss Machico, invited me to this, and everybody else, Miss Moffat, invited me here today. So I appreciate that you all here and if you are here, it's because you are the leader that the society needs. You are, the need, you are that key person. The key is the forgiveness. I forgive the, the two boys. I forgive the parents. I forgive the doctors. I forgive 
everybody else that tried to, you know, to stop me from loving. You can't stop love. No, you can't. No matter what you do. Let's work together, love together, keep loving, loving, loving. Don't, you know, it won't hurt. Love don't hurt. Sometimes they, they, will hurt, they will try to hurt you, but then you said, it doesn't hurt me. How can this person keep doing that? But it doesn't, it doesn't hurt me. So you go and do something good for that person. Show what love is. Because you got to show what your nature, your natural, your essence. If your essence is love, give what you have. That's what you are built of. That, that's, that's what really, right, Eva? Yeah, yeah my lovely Eva. So th that's what we need to do each other. Let's love each other. Let help our kid. Let help our society by doing that. And we we are building the kingdom of God by doing our job. Kingdom of God. The the uh, people are blind. They're in darkness, but darkness and light are inside of us too. It depends what what are we nurturing? Are we doing something resentment or are we doing something wrong for somebody else or thinking bad about one person? That come from the darkness, that come from ego. You don't want that. Once you know that, you said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, mine. I gotta switch this. I, I have the power to transform this and do it the other way, do the opposite. Do the opposite and it will work. It will work. So thank you very much. I don't want to take more time, but <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I also want to bring up my stuff. We have this one is working. We have her Her Story Award, which has a special message for you. It says the Her Story Award is proudly presented to Sonia Reyes in recognition of your exemplary dedication to the support and empowerment of nurturing healthy, happy families by cultivating ethical values and living lives for a greater purpose. We honor you as a peace leader who lives by the logic of love. Let's give her a big round of applause. And we're gonna take a picture, Concha, Sonia and I. Congratulations, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Reyes. Our next nominee and awardee is Ms. Sue Taylor, National Public Affairs Director of the Church of Scientology National Affairs Office. Reverend Taylor was ordained as a minister of the church in 1971. In 1976, she moved from Los Angeles, from all the way here to DC, across country, where she took a position in public affairs for the church. Since that time, she has worked on many of the church's outreach programs, including drug education, human rights, community affairs, and her one passion, interreligious, international religious freedom. Working on religious freedom issues for the Church of Scientology, as well as others, she has traveled all around the world from South Africa to Mexico, Norway and Sweden to France, from Russia to Germany, and from Italy to Kazakhstan, bringing people together. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Before we bring up Reverend Taylor, I would first like to invite the person who nominated her for this award, Ms. Elizabeth I, to share a few minutes of why she nominated her today. Still morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Elizabeth Ahe. I'm the chairperson for 
Women's Federation for World Peace, DC chapter. I met Reverend Taylor, Susan Taylor, I think 2009 at Interfaith Prayer Breakfast. So we exchanged our business cards and then I followed up. And then she invited me to see one of her uh, uh, premises on 16th Street in Washington, DC. Over the years, we have worked together with the Reverend Taylor. Um, during our event, she has been a speaker, but also once we took uh, the youth to United Nations for international human, uh, youth human rights. Uh, I nominated Reverend Taylor because she's an advocate for peace and religious freedom. I nominated her because she serves, you know, in the community, local community, the nation, and the world. She volunteers when there's crisis, like in Haiti. She has traveled to many countries, you know, to save. But also, she has a heart of God. <laughs> she loves people, you know, and she cares for people. And she gives a lot. Uh, she offered sometimes uh, the premises for us to have a Women Federation events. And um, I can't thank her enough. So I, I don't want to say much, but I really. I'm really happy that she's one of the women who are honored today because of serving the community. So please help me to welcome Reverend Taylor <laughs> on the stage. We often need help from others. <laughs> so as Sonia said, it's really, really difficult to compact so many decades, not years, but so many decades into just a small, short time. So I'm going to share with you just some of my stories. So good morning. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much for your kind invitation. It's absolutely fantastic and such an honor to be here with so many people that have helped so many others. So I was asked to share three main lessons I have learned in my life's journey. There are of course hundreds, but let me share just three stories with you. So number one, persistence, staying the course, knowing what you want. Number two, working together, we are all stronger in coalition and stronger when helping each other. <laughs> Number three, and most importantly, knowing that we are spiritual beings and not just flesh, and knowing the difference between the secular, the temporal world, and the spiritual. I have been blessed with many accomplishments during my life, but most of them since beginning my involvement in Scientology in 1969. I grew up in Connecticut in the 1950s, had a normal life, Average student, two brothers, wonderful parents, love of animals, climbing trees, and exploring the, the places and the things behind my house. I graduated from the University of Colorado with a degree in physical geography and geology. I loved the out of doors, mountaineering, did an exp expedition to Peru, climbing 20,000 foot peaks, rock climbing in Yosemite, teaching skiing in Jackson, Wyoming, marrying an avalanche hazard forecaster and living at Alta, Utah, perhaps the best ski area in the country. <laughs> you can say, I love the outdoors. <laughs> but little things marked my early journey. Persistence and knowingness of what I wanted helped me to stay the course. At the age of 14, my parents banned me from my Christian friends and from reading the Bible. 
This, as you can imagine, did not set well with me. At 16, my congregational church minister, while preparing me for my confirmation ceremony, responded to my question of what do I do, excuse me, what if I do not agree with what you want me to say during the ceremony? This was very important to me. And he responded, don't worry, you will understand when you grow up. As you can imagine, this too did not sit very well with me. <laughs> and was basically the end of my church going days for many years. At 17, my school counselor told me that I was not college material. This really did not sit well with me because I knew I wanted to go to school in Colorado, and I did. So these little things sit with you. But early on, when I was 14, I realized I was a spiritual being and not just a body. I knew what I wanted, and I persisted in getting it. While living at Alta, Utah, which is just outside of Salt Lake City, in 1969, I found out about Scientology in Salt Lake City. This changed my life and put my feet on a more spiritual path. In 1970, I joined church staff and have been staff member ever since. So it's really hard to believe that it's been over 50 years now. Yikes. <laughs> so this is where I learned the second uh, lesson. This is where I learned working together was much stronger than working alone. And I don't mean just as an individual, but as an organization as well. So all during the 1980s and 1990s, we fought against the Cult Awareness Network and courts, which did not understand that deprogramming was a federal crime and not just a family member matter. We fought alongside the Unification Church for years for our basic rights against the horrors of deprogramming, kidnapping, and being denied the right to practice our faiths. But again, persistence, knowing we are spiritual beings and working in coalition has led to many, many successes. After 20 years of working in the trenches in battle with US government agencies, like the IRS, the FBI, the post office, and others, and of course the media, Scientology was finally recognized as a religion in 1993. Scientology, the Unification Church, and many others have suffered throughout the years at the hands of many governments who desired to wipe us out of existence or bar us from existing in the first place. They did, not, they did this through denying us religious recognition, ruling against us in courts, persecuting us in the media, and sending some of our members to prison. As mentioned in my bio, I have taken this fight personally to many countries to fight against governments, media, and our basic rights. As mentioned, you know, from Mexico to Canada, Norway, Germany, France, Kazakhstan, South Africa, etc. Again, knowing that we were fighting side by side with others for our basic spiritual rights, we knew if we just persisted, we would win, and we are. The fight continues, but we are all winning. In the United States, we helped pass the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, which formed the US State Department's International Religious Freedom Office. It also formed the US Commission on International Religious Freedom and the position of ambassador at large for international religious freedom. This act passed in 1998 is the bedrock of US government policy we are now working with today. I continue today in this field with my participation with Michael and others here in the room, uh, with the International Religious Freedom Roundtable as one of its founding participants, and continue the global movement to bring about religious freedom for all around the world. And we meet every week to keep issues alive and continue to advocate and fight against persecution, genocide, and abuses against individuals, as well as faith organizations. And one of the issues that we're working on right now is the situation in Japan. We do not use guns or force but we use the pen, the rule of law in the country, and the truth to change ideas. The stories of my three lessons learned span more than just fighting for religious freedom. I founded the Churches of Scientology Disaster Response and have been the national director for over 20 years now, working side by side, again, in coalition with FEMA, other churches, the Red Cross, and hundreds of other groups, large and small, all over the United States helping those in need following the devastation of hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods. Again, the spiritual aspect has played a key role. If I might, I'd like to share a story regarding spiritual care. As you know, spiritual care comes in all forms. 
So this is a really special little story for me. <laughs> so it happened in North Carolina in, um, uh, excuse me, 2018 after Hurricane Florence. And um, our team was helping an elderly man at a house that had been flooded up to the second story. And um, so as we were helping, you know, removing debris and working all day long, and his wife wanted all the little artifacts that you know, had been destroyed, you know, brought out on the front lawn, laid out in the sunshine to dry out, and then we had to clean them all. So we're doing we're moving mattresses, doing all kinds of things. And then uh, at the end of the day, we joined, you know, in the driveway, and uh, we wanted to just say a little prayer before we went home that night. And so the elderly man joined us in the circle, and then we almost started to pray, and he said, no, stop. And we all kind of like looked at him, it's like, what's going on, right? He said, I need to tell you something before we pray. And he said, last night, I was completely depressed. He said, my wife has cancer. My this is the third time that my house has been flooded up to the second story. And he said, I'm really, really tired. And I was contemplating suicide. Okay, this is incredible, right? He said, but then, when I saw you all come this morning, drive up at their driveway with your bright yellow shirts on, he said, I knew sunshine had arrived. And he said, after today's work, he said, I no longer am contemplating suicide. It was incredible, yes. <laughs> so the point of that little, little story was that spiritual care does come in many, many different forms. And just embracing somebody in certain ways or whatever can help them spiritually. So with hundreds of stories like this, as uh, I helped those in need, I knew I had touched the spirit of people and had pulled them a bit more out of the temporal world to see the brighter things in life so they could get on with their lives. This is just one story, <coughs> and I have many more from my disaster response work as well as other hats. And again, as mentioned earlier, I'm the church's faith advisor to the Foundation for a Drug-Free World, helping to educate adults and youth about the dangers of drugs and the harm they bring not only to the body but to the spirit as well. And with others, I have been helping educate young people on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights through our Youth for Human Rights program. And it too has its own stories. And one really short little story here is one little schoolboy several days after a Youth for Human Rights presentation at his school told his teacher, I had been thinking about suicide before I heard the human rights lecture. Now I am not. And we never found out what the details were or anything like that, but just knowing that you've been communicating and changing people's lives. So this is another lesson learned for me. Don't stop sharing. <laughs> you never know when uh, what you share with someone will change his life. And years later, he comes back to you and says, you know, I can't thank you for what you told me years ago. It has saved my life. And you stop and you smile and say, okay, <laughs> and you wonder, what did I say now, many years ago that changed his life? But the point is, it doesn't matter. We touch lives for the better. There is hope and there is help in the world. So to thumb, sum things up, my three lessons of persistence, work in coalition, having total certainty that we are spiritual beings, and adding one more, don't stop sharing, have inspired me and made my life what it is. I would like to add one more thought too. Perhaps the hardest task one can have is to continue to love his fellows despite all reasons he should not. And if I might close with one quote from our founder, L. Ron Hubbard, who said, quote, to hate alone is the road to disaster. To love is the road to strength. To love in spite of all is the secret of greatness and may very well be the greatest secret in this universe. And so we continue to do God's work. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sue. Let's give her one more big round of applause. And Elizabeth, if you can come back up. We have her special Her Story Award here. And just so you know, Sue remembers me as a little girl, too. She's close friends with my parents. So look at our world today. <laughs> the Her Story Award is proudly presented to Sue Taylor in honor of your unwavering investment in our wider community including drug prevention, human rights, community affairs, and especially for your passionate work for international religious freedom. We honor you as a peace leader who lives by the logic of love.
Congratulations. <laughs> and we'll take a picture. Reverend Taylor, I aspire to have a life as well-traveled as yours, <laughs> but also to be as passionate and loving as you too. Thank you so much. Our third awardee for this afternoon today is Tsehe Habtsalasye, Regional Director from Fox Rehabilitation. Tsehe Habtsalasye is a passionate and resourceful regional director and occupational therapist with nearly 10 years of experience providing care to seniors in our community. Tsehe has a Master of Science in Occupational Therapy from Howard University, where she graduated with cum laude and was a member of Phi Theta Epsilon Occupational Therapy Honor Society. Tsehe also holds a Master of Education in Instructional Technology design and development from George Mason University, where she also graduated with summa cum laude. In her free time, she enjoys cooking authentic Ethiopian cuisine, yum, and playing outside with her husband, Teddy, and their four children, Abel, Abigail, Helen, and Abraham. Before we bring up Ms. Haptasilasie, I would like to bring up the person who nominated her for this award, Mr. David Moffitt, to share a few minutes of why he nominated her. Good morning, <laughs> good afternoon. Ah, a lot of good energy in this room, I feel the love. I am very excited to invite the next awardee for the Her Story Award, Tsahai Habtasalase. It took me a while to practice her name, but... Uh, so Tsahai and I work for a company called Fox Rehab, and we provide physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy services to the elderly population. It's a very rewarding work, and Sahai is my boss. <laughs> she is the regional director for our Maryland team, and she doesn't appreciate being called boss, I think. She would prefer that I call her my colleague, which she is my colleague. In our private conversations, she refers to me as my friend, my brother. And I really feel that, because Tahai is my sister. Tahai is someone who I would describe as luminous and bright. And in fact, her name, Tahai, translates from Amharic, which is the language of Ethiopia, to sunshine. And most of the people uh, in her life, in her professional life, call her by, her, by that name, sunshine. Very aptly named, very appropriate. Tahai brings the light into our team, into our work. And she does this not just in her words, not just in her actions, but she does this in, through spirit and through her faith in God. She is someone who prays for us, for the people on her team, for her patients, all of the time, very sincerely, <laughs> and that's something that I appreciate and respect most about her, is that it's one thing to know, it's one thing to be a child of God, because we are all children of God, but it's another thing to know that you are a child of God, and to high as someone who knows who she is as God's daughter, and that is a beautiful thing, something that I aspire to to understand in myself as a son of God. And so, without further ado, I'd like to welcome up my boss, my colleague, my friend, my sister, Tsahai Hatesalase.
told myself I wasn't going to cry, but, <laughs> oh man, David, I don't know, I don't know what to say, I'm speechless. Um, good morning, I know, is it afternoon, morning, I'm not even sure. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Um, before I begin, I would be remiss if I didn't thank David for nominating me for this award. Um, I've known David for about seven years now and worked alongside him. I can confidently say he is one of the kindest and most skilled phys physical therapists I know. I am grateful and blessed to have you alongside me working every day and making such an impact in our community. Thank you, David, for all you do. Please give David a round of applause. I'm honored to have been chosen as a re recipient for the Her Story Award. This award celebrates the triumph of women despite insurmountable challenges and memorializes their resilience, grit, and spirit. So a round of applause for all the awardees. <laughs> Why I cannot fully express into words how much this award means to me, I can do one thing. I can tell you how my story is made possible because of my faith and my family. I wanna please, if everyone could give a round of applause to my father who's here, my mother, and my husband. Thank you. Also my brother with the camera. <laughs> time and time again, when my tank was emptied, when my spirit low, I was often found renewed and restored by the, by the hands of the one who created it all. The overwhelming love of those closest to me. In our time on this earth, we often think about how our pen authors our story. But a lesson I learned in my life is that God is the ultimate wordsmith. And his story would always be better, no matter how clever the metaphors, no matter how hard I tried. This lesson, however, wasn't readily apparent. My story begins with an unfavorable hand. As we sit here this morning, or this afternoon, <laughs> in the Washington Times building, it is not lost on me that millions of people in this world are dealt a hand in life where hopelessness and desperation can feel like an infestation. You see, my story begins in the countryside of Ethiopia. For the historians in the room, you'll recall that Ethiopians' notoriety in the 80s stemmed from the worst humanitarian crisis of the decade, a ravishing famine that claimed the lives of one million people. My family did what anyone would do. They fled. When we arrived in Nairobi, Kenya, as refugees, we weren't seeking prosperity. We sought survival. We slept on the floors of muddy camps, caged in by rusting steel, and posters plastered of what I would later come to recognize as the emblem of the American Red Cross. Remember that, mom and dad? I was four. But the ache in my stomach and the fear on my parents' face is etched in my memory forever. I prayed, even as a little girl, I prayed. And as I would come to find God wasn't through writing my story. He wanted to give me a taste of America's promise. Through a series of fortunate events, what I like to call miracles, my parents were sponsored by a family in Boston. I must warn you, this part of my story, while infinitely better than our circumstances in Nairobi, was not a rendition of a Disney's happily ever after story. 
After all, it was Boston in the 80s. It was Boston in the 80s for three Africans who didn't speak a lick of English. It was hard. I was met with a barrage of racism and ignorance that felt like a tide eroding my self-esteem. While God was writing my story, my family, my mother and father, were providing me with the tools to overcome a new set of challenges on my horizon. Grit, a sound temperament, and an unwavering commitment to service. My parents made the hard decision to move to Maryland where they couldn't afford much and certainly not childcare. I have vivid memories of what I've coined the drop. As one parent headed to work and the other clocked out of a shift, I would be swapped on the platform at Metro Center to ensure I was never left alone. Today, I stand before you as the first in my family to have achieved a bachelor's degree. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be my only degree either. I would later graduate from two separate universities, including DC's own, the illustrious Howard University. I serve as an occupational therapist and a regional director for Fox Rehabilitation. I use the words serve intentionally. I provide care for our most vulnerable population, those often overlooked and marginalized, those dealing with insurmountable challenges like learning how to walk again or speak again. As you can imagine, it's a full circle moment for me. It's the story that I can never write, but the one that was written for me. As the great philosopher Oprah Winfrey once stated, God always has a greater dream for you than you do for yourself. My hope today is that my story inspires, no matter your starting point, no matter your mountain, trust that your community will give you the tools and that your story is being written by the greatest author we've ever known. Thank you. Wow, it's so high. Let's give her one more big round of applause. And let's bring David up too. David is my husband, so this is like a special, special experience for us. We learned so much about you today, actually. We didn't know, thank you. I'm gonna read your award here, it's so high. It says, in honor of, of this Her Story Award is proudly presented to Sahai Hapta Selassie in honor of your passionate service in your professional and personal life and your model of leadership, which serves as a powerful demonstration of the scope and impact of a woman's touch. We honor you as a peace leader who lives by the logic of love. Congratulations. Wonderful, congratulations. One more awardee to go. Thank you so much for your wisdom, Sahai. And last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce Ms. Magna Faith Karimi, proprietress from JK Academy Elementary and High School and community builder. Magna Faith Karimi provides mentorship and training for women under United Nations and African Union affiliated organizations through her proven expertise in human resources, media, and education. While, organ while recognized for advocating for women in Africa, Ms. Karimi founded JK Academy showing her commitment to education and community-driven service. Currently, JK Academy offers 100% tuition-free quality education to over 50 children and reduced tuition fees to over 150 children through, excuse me, 
to over 150 children from Africa, from kindergarten through senior secondary school. Creamy built clean, free water, hole, water bore, boreholes and provides cultural, vocational, and technical education programs for local communities in Nigeria. Under the umbrella of the African Union, her team facilitated the first annual STEM camp for children of African descent in the District of Columbia. That is awesome. <laughs> She continues to advocate internationally, writing articles and speaking at prestigious institutions, and happily married with three beautiful children, Magna Faith Creamy is an astute woman leader, mentor, and a change agent who continues to change the narrative today. So before we invite her up, I would like to invite her nominee, Dr. Ashil Akalatse, to share a few words for her. It is good afternoon now, right? <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so good to see you all. Yeah, it's my honor and privilege to introduce a great woman of God. The first time I met uh, Miss Magna Faith Creamy was at the prayer breakfast. <laughs> and she, I don't know whether I should remember, it's at the Bishop Kennedy, Vengi Kennedy Church. <laughs> in Maryland, and we had a prayer breakfast. In, uh, it, it was outdoor. And she was introduced to sing a song. And she sang beautifully a Christian song. And then I knew this lady has really something inside of her. And we became friends. He was, she was first invited by Dan Burton and uh, became friends. And I <clears throat> introduced Mother Moon, the founder of the Women Federation for World Peace, to her and introduced her memoir, The Mother of Peace, to her. And she read the memoir and I asked her to, you know, to share with me what she learned from the memoir. And it was, I was just really blown away for how much she right away fell in love with our founder. And as she was uh, sharing her takeaway from the book, she was actually tearing, she was actually crying. I said, there we go. And, and she said to me that, why is it that the world does not know about the mother of peace, Dr. Hakia Hanmon? You, you, you heard from her brief, <laughs> very brief bio that was just right to you. Um, but she, she's someone who really loved God dearly and who really fight to empower women, especially in Africa. She's from Nigeria and uh, she recently created this academy, JK Academy. And where, when I see the pictures on Facebook, together with her husband, how they invested to build this school to educate really hundreds of young people to really give them a chance. And not only that, but also to empower the mothers, the women there. And one of the things that she really does that I'm also very proud of is the fact that she, she, she fights for the freedom of Christians who have been persecuted in Nigeria. If you know the history of Nigeria, Christian will be persecuted by the Muslim. And, and, and there's so many uh, atrocities you know, being done to Christian. And she, she founded this news media called War Desk News. And she denounced those atrocities and stand for truly religious freedom and for the freedom of Christian in Nigeria. There's so much more to share about this great woman of God Please join me in welcoming Miss Magna Faith Creamy for her history award. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I want to honor everyone that's here today. I want to honor you because um, out of your busy schedule, 
you've chosen to be here to celebrate us. Um, and, and I'm most grateful. I also want to honor the executives and the leadership um, of the Women um, Federation um, for World Peace. And I also want to honor the ministers of the gospel here, um, and of course, leaders, and um, of course, um, community builders in the house. I honor you um, in Jesus' name. I, I listened to my sister's story and I was very moved and I could identify and relate to what she was saying. Um, I think the only difference there would be, I was raised in the northern part of Nigeria, Katsina particularly, but I was raised by very comfortable parents, um, a Christian family in Katsina, um, mostly predominantly a Muslim state. Um, and um, I was betrothed at the age of 16, after which I was married off against my will at the age of 19. Um, and at the time I was, I was, you know, in the process of getting my degree, my first degree in economics. Um, and I would say coincidentally or accidentally, I don't want to say unfortunately, my first child was born with mental retardation, developmental delay. Um, and um, that the culture of the man that I married didn't allow for women to have those kind of kids, so to say, because then you're termed a witch, possessed, or whatever it is. And so um, I was more or less seen as a witch or someone who was possessed, and that was the beginning of my problem. And I said it, you know, um, being battered, I was abused physically, um, and it got to a point where I couldn't take it anymore. Um, but one thing I really want to thank my parents, my late parents who are not here, is that when they saw that it was life-threatening, they didn't force me to stay. They allowed me to leave, and I was able to leave that marriage with three beautiful girls. Um, after which, I came to the United States of America with three beautiful girls, a single mother, at the age of 22, um, and started my life all over again. The beauty of this award, um, this award today is not to show how perfect a woman I am, but it's to tell about the victories and the victory and the joy and the lessons and the strength in my travel. And so, in coming to the United States at the age of 22 with three beautiful children, one in a wheelchair, I began my journey. I decided to pursue a master's, actually a master's of business administration with a focus on human resources at the University of Australia University in Washington, DC. And I graduated in 2016. It took me longer than normal, but I did it. Um, I also followed up to um, obtain another master's um, in management with a focus on women in leadership, and I graduated in 2018. One thing that happened to me was the fact that I didn't want my children, my girl children, to identify or to know me by a woman that was violently abused. And I wanted them to see a strong woman. I wanted them to see a great woman. I wanted them to understand that it doesn't matter what life throws at you, whether accidentally, coincidentally, or even self-inflicted, you can change the narrative. You can change the story. And in the midst of all of that, God blessed me with an amazing man, never been married before, never had children, who 
is a representative and a representation of God on earth, saw that I was in a situation that was not of my own doing. Because you know, when you see single mothers, you see divorced women, we all assume that, you know, whatever. But in my case, I was forced into marriage at a young age. And he saw my story, he saw my children, and he decided to cover me. He gave me his name. And today, I am happily married. While raising my three girls, and with tens of brain surgery on my first daughter, whom was rejected and dejected by her biological father, I decided to reach back home because I, I know, I knew at the time and I know today that there are very many other young children, young girls, young women, young ladies like myself who may not particularly have the opportunity to travel to the United States to start afresh. You know, and I decided to look back to begin to help them. One of the ways that I decided to help was through advocacy, through education, having to let them know that you don't have to remain where you were. In spite of whatever it is that life has thrown at you, you can pick up the pieces of your broken life. And so I started traveling around Africa to Liberia first, to Sierra Leone, to Cameroon, to Ethiopia, um, to speak to different groups of women, to encourage them, and then also to empower them, to provide them with possible resources that they can use to start their lives all over again, especially single mothers. Uh, in 2013, I founded JK Academy. I started with a block, and then over the years, block upon block, pillar after pillar, I was able to build a school, 100% funded by me and my husband, no, no, um, no funding from any organization whatsoever. We built an elementary and a secondary school that provided 100% um, tuition-free quality education for at least 50 children, and of course, reduced tuition fee for over 100. And currently, we do have almost 300 children at that school, and we have about seven to eight blocks, and I mean very huge blocks, I mean buildings. Uh, and I'm very proud of all of, of all of the things that I've achieved. JK Academy is the most important to me, and the reason is because I'm able to go to the foundation to begin to teach children the importance of family. Because I, I understand what it means when things go wrong at the foundation. I understand what it means when you miss it first. It doesn't matter if it's your fault or not. If you miss it the first time, you can recover, but a lot of wrong, a lot of things, a lot of experiences, tears, pain, not only are these things inflicted upon you, but also upon the people that are around you? In my case, my girl children, who had been exposed to not having a father, who I had to leave and care of other people so I could go to school. And I don't know what would have happened in those, within those hours that I left them. Just a lot of things, being able to work go to school, and at the same time, put food on the table for three children. I wanted these children to understand the importance of getting it right the first time. Getting it right with your education, getting it right with your marriage, getting it right with building a family, and staying 
within that family. If you're a man, being a father in that family. If you're a woman, being a mother in that family. If you're a husband, being a husband to your wife. If you're a wife, being a wife to your husband. Because the decisions that you make affect everyone, not only within your family, but also within the community. And so JK Academy. <laughs> and so JK Academy is committed to ensuring that these children that we are raising today understand the very importance of their role, not only in, within their family, but within the community, that the choices and the decisions that they make today affects the community and ultimately the nation. And so, <laughs> and so we take it upon ourselves not only to focus on the academic side of the curriculum, but to focus on life, life's lessons, to focus on love, to focus on service, to focus on growth, to focus on changing the narrative and making an impact, no matter how little. This is what JK Academy represents. And finally, I'm gonna say that I really wanna thank my children for being very patient with me because there were days and weeks that I had to leave them by themselves with babysitters to go get an education, to go work extra hours, to find love again, you know, to help others in the community, and they were patient. And so I really want to thank them for supporting me through it all, supporting me to become the woman that I am and the woman that I'm going to be because I continue to evolve. I also want to thank Dr. Shill for believing in me. You've always supported me in all of my engagements, in all of my programs and projects. You've been there as a rock, and I totally, honestly appreciate you. And lastly, to, the, to our guests here, I want to let you know that not everything that glitters is gold. The faces that you see on the outside do have stories beneath them, so give people a chance. Pastor Shiel, you want to come take our photo together? So we have your Her Story Award. It says the Her Story Award is proudly presented to Magna Faith Creamy in recognition of your community leadership, advocacy, and mentorship in the United States and abroad, contributing to a more interconnected, harmonious, and peace-loving world. We honor you as a peace leader who lives by the logic of love. Congratulations. For a big round of applause. Oh, and here's your little gift. Thank you. And again, another big round of applause to all of our women leaders today. Can we just look at one another and say thank you? <laughs> thank, you. thank you all so much for being here today. And lastly, to close our afternoon together, I would like to invite Ms. Natasha Dupe, Executive Director of Women's Policy and Initiatives for the Officer of Mayor Bowser of Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, I am Natasha Dupe. Welcome to DC. If this is not your home, hopefully you feel like there's a homecoming. I say that I am here on behalf of Mayor Bowser, so I greet you with that joy. All right. There's an enthusiast. She's a champion for the district. 
So I came as a part of her team, so this is our team energy. I am so grateful to have the leader, the founder of the World Federation for Peace here, our president. Thank you so much to all the honorees. Congratulations, happy Women's History Month. I take it not for granted that there is a office established in our city dedicated to women. Not only just women, but so that there is policy written for us. That is powerful. Even in America, that is powerful. Especially in America, that is powerful. Y'all watching the news? Okay. Um, I do want to bring up a couple things uh, we're highlighting in D.C. for Women's History Month. We started out our kickoff with something called a Good Trouble Revival. A Good Trouble Revival. I think that's really important for what we're doing today. Revival, we're calling back into a, attention, right? Stirring up some energy, regardless of our faith walks. We all have a purpose that we're centering ourselves in. We all have an energy that we have to re-inspire, right? We have to have a little encouragement to say, I'm gonna try a little bit more today, right? The good trouble concept, some people know the brother, John Lewis, okay, rest in peace, right? He says we have to do necessary acts to change this world. Sometimes our necessary acts were described by our honorees, Right? It might be changing a career. It may say, I'm going to do something different that my family hasn't done. It may mean a sacrifice. That taking a stance requires a daily revival. And so I hope today, if you were an honoree, that you feel that extra encouragement that someone's hand is with you on your shoulder every day that you stand. If you are a celebration as a member of the village, I hope you know that you are the wind beneath someone's wings. You're necessary. The people who nominated you are necessary as somebody's person, the wind beneath their wings. I'll land with one more thing. As we think about um, the office that I represent for the mayor here in the district, um, we are fighting for DC statehood. DC statehood, the 51st state soon to be. All right, and so as we want certain laws to be passed, the budget to not be on the brink every six months, every three months, there's a constant confusion about what is gonna be the status of women, right? There are certain things that are on the ballot. When we think about DC statehood, we also think about our roles in it. So if you're a DC resident or a resident of another state, that's a part of our conversation. Okay, all the things that we're centering in as it talks about behavioral health, those things are in legislation on the national level. And so I bring that up to say, as you think about your friends here in the district, we also are in a fight. And so I'll land with another congratulations. Thank you so much for participating here in the district. We're excited to have you. And I'll encourage you, if you have not, there's a couple things. There is an exhibit, because I, I think art is a way that we can also revive, get encouragement. There's a National Museum for Women in the Arts straight down this street on New York Avenue. You don't even have to do any turns. It's called the National Museum of Women in the Arts. I encourage you to take a visit while you're here. Go downtown, get some good food. Yeah, put it in the program. Okay, um, but again, ex explore, feel encouraged, think back to this day, and know that DC is also a champion in the work, and we welcome you to come back to have more programs here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you again, Ms. Natasha DP, and thank you everyone. That concludes our program for today, but before we go, I would like to invite all of our nominees and our awardees and all of our guests today to join us in the front for a group photo.
also this stage here is available that you can get a little extra height. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining. Please enjoy your refreshments outside, and we will see you next time. <laughs>